Uh, yeah. So we're very glad today to uh, to welcome our Peter Rizwaz. She has her PhD from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, uh, where she was advised by Sid uh, Parman and uh, Narhari, who I know, um, and she's a circus fellow. Um, so with that, please take it away, uh, Peter. Thank you so much. So uh, I just want to wanted to clarify how much time do I have for the talk? I think in total, roughly 30 minutes. So maybe a 25 minute talk and then five minutes questions. Okay, okay, good. So yeah, hello everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a fair allocation of indivisible goods under structured set systems. And um, uh, so I'm, I'm recently, I'm currently a, a postdoc fellow at Harvard and I joined, uh, started two weeks back. Uh, before that I was a uh, visiting researcher at Google Research. And um, as, as David mentioned, I was I did my PhD from Indian Institute of Science, and my thesis was about providing fair algorithms for uh, problems such as allocation, recommendation, and classification. So uh, with that, uh, let's. Uh, so here's the outline of my talk. I'll start by describing what is a fair allocation problem, and then I'll talk about some popular fairness notions. I'll get into this uh, fair allocation problem under co constraint settings. And uh, I'll show um, uh, how one can leverage the fair allocation problem solutions to solve problems in a uh, fair recommendation. And I'll conclude with by listing some uh, future directions. So let's um, start with what is a fair allocation problem. So we are given a set of agents, uh, N, a set of goods, M, and valuations of each good for each agent. And uh, here we assume that the valuations are non-negative and also they are additive in the sense that if you have a bundle of goods, then the value for the entire bundle is equal to sum of value of the individual goods in the same bundle. So given all this, the goal now is to find a fair allocation uh, of this uh, set of goods, which is like an N partition of the uh, set M. And the key questions are, what do we mean by fairness here? And once we define a fairness notion, can we show that such a fair allocation always exists? And then can we provide efficient algorithms to find such a fair allocation? So let us first look at the definitions of fairness. Uh, for fair allocation of divisible goods, also known as the cake cutting problem, the two classical fairness notions are envy freeness and uh, proportional fair share. Now, what is envy freeness? So here, every agent, uh, so this fairness notion ensures that if you compare to a pair of agents, then uh, every agent should value their own bundle more than uh, it, it values any, anyone else's bundle. This is uh, like you compare every pair and uh, if it is envy free for every pair, then you call the particular allocation envy free allocation. And uh, another fairness uh, notion is proportional fair share. Here, uh, every agent is supposed to have a valuation which is greater than or equal to some threshold. And this threshold is the total value of all the goods uh, for that particular agent divided by the total number of agents. So uh, the problem with this fairness notions uh, for indivisible goods is that it doesn't translate well in the divisible case. And then there's this simple example where you have one good and two agents and you have to give the good to one of the agent. And the other agent would uh, envy uh, the person who got it and also will not satisfy their uh, proportional fair share guarantee. So this led to the study of um, notions which are more appropriate for indivisible goods. And um, uh, so, so some of the fairness notions are envy freeness up to one good, EF1, and maximum share guarantee, MMS. And these notions are analogs of envy freeness and proportional fair share respectively. So recently, this fair allocation problem for indivisible goods has gained significant attention and all these recent papers attempt to answer the existential and algorithmic questions for EF1 and MMS. So let me now define uh, what do we mean by EF1 allocation. 
So an allocation is said to be EF1 if for every pair of agents I and J, there exists at least one good in agent, agent J's bundle such that when you hypothetically remove that good, you do not envy that person anymore. Let's look uh, at it with the help of an example. So uh, here we have two allocation for two agents, A, uh, A1 and A2. Now, what we uh, see is this allocation is not NB free in the sense that for agent one, the value for A2 bundle is more than A1. So it's not NB free. However, this allocation is EF1 because there exists a good, which is a blue ball, which when you hypothetically remove, agent one do not, will not NB agent two anymore. So um, basically this A1, A2 is not NB free. However, this is an EF1 allocation. And now that we have defined EF1, let us look at some of the guarantees. So EF1 always exists. And then there are algorithms provided by uh, Lipton et al. and Karyaganas et al. to achieve EF1 allocation in polynomial time. Um, okay, now I'll talk about another fairness notion, which is maximum share allocation. Uh, so here an allocation is set to achieve maximum share guarantee if every agent gets a value which is greater than or equal to the, uh, the maximum threshold. So I'll try to explain what this uh, maximum share threshold is. So um, let's say that uh, an agent is hypothetically asked to partition the total set of goods into n parts. Now in worst case, this agent would get uh, the minimum of all the partitions that uh, the agent has made. Uh, so the agent would naturally try to maximize the worst case bundle. And this value is known as the max, uh, maximum share threshold. So the idea of fairness here is to allocate in such a way so that everybody gets uh, more than their maximum threshold. So uh, the uh, bad news here is that MMS may not always be guaranteed. And this has led to the study of approximate MMS, where instead of MMS threshold, the aim is to allocate alpha times uh, MMS threshold, where alpha is a number between zero to one. Now, uh, notice that all these results exist for unconstrained uh, fair allocation problem. And um, okay, if, if before that, uh, for approximate MMS, we have uh, several algorithms that gives two third MMS. And uh, recently, not very recently, but uh, so there's an algorithm which gives one third, three fourth MMS allocation uh, in, in additive setting. So all these results are for unconstrained settings. So basically what we know is EF1 always exists and uh, the, the approximate MMS that you can get in polynomial time is three fourth till now. Um, and this setting is a, a special case of the constraint setting, uh, which is a more general scenario. So this constraint setting was earlier unexplored. And uh, there are important open questions in this space that can we have EF1 and MMS allocation even under constraint settings. So um, today we'll uh, look at two particular constrained uh, settings. Uh, one of them is called cardinality constraint and then a more general constraint called matroid constraint. And I'll formalize them in subsequent slides. So um, let's jump right to the toy example to motivate the problem of cardinality constraints first. Um, assume that there's a museum and uh, the museum wants to divide its exhibits among uh, set of uh, its new branches. Now observe that these exhibits have two natural properties. One is that they are indivisible. So for example, a painting or a sculpture cannot be fractionally allocated to a new branch. And um, then the ex these exhibits can be grouped into categories like paintings, contemporary arts, uh, antique pieces, etc. Now observe that there may be a constraint imposed on each of this category. For example, no more than two paintings can be allocated to a particular branch. Now, this pro the problem would be to uh, divide the exhibits among all the branches in a way that the number of exhibits from each category that a particular agent gets does not exceed the given threshold. 
so note that if you only have one category and then uh, the threshold on that category is equal to the total number of goods, then this problem reduces to the uh, unconstrained version of the fair allocation problem. Hence, this constrained version is, uh, I mean, strictly generalizes the unconstrained setting. So the main results with the settings that we have is that EF1 even exists uh, in this um, const cardinality constraint setting. And uh, we give a polynomial time algorithm to find that. And also uh, for MMS, we can achieve one third MMS allocation uh, under this uh, cardinality setting scenario. So uh, I'll, uh, I do not go into the details of the algorithm. So uh, I'll talk about matrix constraint and then describe an algorithm that, uh, that gives you EF1 allocation under uh, one case of matrix constraint. So let's let's try to now understand uh, what is a uh, matroid constraint. So here uh, the problem is the, the constraint is that each person should get an allocation which is independent in terms of some given matroid that is defined over the set of goods. Now, um, what is a matroid? A matroid is a two tuple. It has uh, it has a ground set of elements S, and then uh, it has uh, it also defines a set of uh, independent sets and there are basically two properties that this independent sets follow so for the first property says that if um, a set is independent then all its subsets should also be independent and the second property is in called independent set exchange property which says that if you have two uh, independent sets and one of the set is um, has more number of elements than the other then there exists an element in the a bigger set, which when you transfer it to the smaller set, it still remains independent. So these two properties are satisfied by this uh, set of independent sets. And uh, we, in this thing, let's assume that you have such a matroid defined over the set of goods. And the idea is to um, uh, divide all the goods in a way so that this, um, this independent constraint is satisfied, as well as you achieve some kind of fairness. So we would focus on a special category of matroid, which are known as base orderable matroid. So here the property is that uh, for every pair of bases of given a matroid, for every pair of bases where base is the maximum cardinality independent set that you can find in a matroid. Um, so if you take like two base, then there would always be a bijection uh, between these two bases such that uh, if you swap each uh, pair of this bijection, then uh, the resulting new sets will remain independent. So this is the property of base orderable uh, matroid. And uh, so some of the results uh, on, uh, with using matroids and uh, this fair allocation problems are as follows. So for binary valuation, so all these results are for additive. So even the general ones are means uh, additive only. Uh, so if you look at only binary valuations and you don't need to like allocate all the uh, uh, all the items, then for in agents, uh, even under heterogeneous matrix, which means that every agent has a different uh, constraint defined over the set of items. So heterogeneous in terms of agents. So in, in that for that scenario, you can obtain EF1. And a very recent uh, result by Dror et al. says that uh, with binary valuation and three agent, if you look at base ordered matroid, then you will always, and with complete allocation, you can always find uh, an EF1 allocation. Uh, and if you go to a more general additive valuation, non-binary, but additive, then for two agents uh, and base order matroid constraints, EF1 always exists. So what we show is uh, that for general identical valuation matroids for any uh, number of agents and uh, given a base order matroid constraint, we can always achieve uh, EF1. And we give an algorithm for the same. So uh, this algorithm, uh, the structure is as follows. So this is a pseudo uh, code of the algorithm. So we initialize with a, a partition, which is matroid feasible. And that can be done in polynomial time using 
the algorithm proposed by Gabo and Westerman. And once we have that allocation, uh, we, we, um, now the algorithm would iteratively reallocate the goods between the lowest bundle and the highest bundle until you achieve EF1. And the way to do that is uh, to ensure that there exists a swap, of, a swap of a possible good, which would increase the value of the lowest bundle somehow, and it would also decrease the value of the highest bundle and eventually end up in a EF1 um, uh, EF1 allocation. So uh, we, for this algorithm, the, we rely on this lemma, uh, which um, says that uh, if, if a feasible allocation, let's say feasible means matroid feasible allocation is not EF1, then there always exists a feasible swap between the, uh, between this lowest and the highest bundle in such a way that uh, one, it is it still remains matroid feasible. Second is that uh, the uh, the value of the overall bundle, which the highest agent have, that drops down by at least a multiplicative factor of one minus one by m square, or the cardinality of this highest bundle would decrease by one. So we, we rely on this lemma to show that uh, this algorithm actually uh, terminates, uh, converges in polynomial time, and it also ensures that at last you have an EF1 allocation. And here's a proof sketch for that. So let's say that you have an allocation which is not EF1, which would basically means that for all good in uh, the highest um, bundle, uh, if you take like any, any of this good, then it always satisfies this property that the value of the total uh, the valuation of the lowest valued agent is less than the valuation of the highest valued agent minus the valuation of this particular good. And this happens for all the goods because it's not EF1. Now we look at two cases. The first case is the simple one. So let's say you end up in a loop where uh, in, in one iteration it happens that uh, the number of elements in the highest um, agents bundle is uh, more than the lowest agent, then we can simply use the independent set exchange property and show that it's possible to bring in one uh, good from AH to AL and then uh, it will still be matroid feasible. And uh, so the, the problematic uh, or the more non-trivial case is when uh, the lowest valued bundle have more number of elements and the highest valued bundle have less number of elements or maybe equal. So in that case, we have to still show that there exists some good in L and as well as H when, which when swapped uh, satisfies certain properties. So uh, what we show is there exists an element X in AL and Y in AH which when uh, swapped this uh, independence property holds. And it also um, would guarantee that the value of such uh, this element Y minus value of this element X is always greater than one by T square multiplied by the total value of the highest uh, bundle. And here T is the number of elements in the highest bundle. So the way we prove this is, uh, is somehow, uh, so it, it uses the base ordered property, but uh, if you recall the base ordered property would uh, show that such, um, such an allocation, such a swap exists only for bases or only for uh, two independent sets which have the same cardinality. What we show is even if they are not having same cardinality, one may have a smaller number of elements, one may have higher number of elements, but as long as the independent property holds, uh, you can always find such a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, uh, I mean, again, one-to-one -one mapping in a sense that uh, all the elements of AH will have like a unique mapping to one element of AL. And then uh, using that, you can show that uh, one pair of them will always satisfy this particular expression. And because this is true, uh, we uh, then show that the total value of the new bundle uh, for AH, new in the sense that when you remove v Y and you include X in it, that would always be less than one minus M square uh, fraction of whatever it already had. And this, this uh, we then use to show that because of um, 
because of the fact that the, the decrement is at least uh, a, a bigger chunk, we'll uh, converge to the uh, EF1 allocation in polytime. So the main theorem is this, that this algorithm finds EF1 allocation under uh, base ordered matriarch constraints. Uh, however, the assumption here is that the valuations are identical and additive. So um, with that, let's, um, uh, I, I don't know how much time do I have? I think you have roughly five-ish minutes left. Uh, five for the minutes, presentation. okay, okay. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, so now let's look at how this uh, uh, cardinality or this uh, stru set structured constraints be used for um, uh, a recommendation application. Uh, so here, uh, so I'll, I'll uh, use the last uh, few minutes to kind of uh, give a high level overview of how can you achieve two-sided fairness in recommendation systems? So the scenario is this, that you have N customers and you have M producers. Now, uh, the problem is to uh, show the advertisements of these producers to the customers. And let's say there's an overall constraint that each customer can be shown at most three advertisements. And maybe this is because of the screen space uh, that you can only uh, show them at most three when they open the app. And now um, let's, so, so traditionally what would happen is a recommendation algorithm will give some relevance scores between each customer and producer. And now the top three of this, for this example, the top three uh, producers would be then shown to the, to each uh, user or customer. But the problem there is you might, there can be, there might be producers uh, who do not fall under top three of any of the customers and they won't be uh, exposed to, uh, or they won't be visible to any customers. And uh, to, to ensure that that doesn't happen, let's uh, uh, try to formalize that into a, fairness problem and we say that we want each of the producer to achieve some threshold guarantee and that can be either MMS guarantee or some alpha MMS guarantee. So uh, how do we define max min share in, in for this problem? We would call the max min share for each producer to be the total number of slots divided by the total number of producers. And in this case, this is two. So once we know that this is the, um, this is the minimum uh, exposure that we want each producer to give, then we would make those many copies of the producers and this will translate to an uh, allocation uh, problem where fairness on the customer sites can be thought of as an EF1 fairness. Uh, one, uh, another constraint that we may need is uh, that we don't want both these copies to go to a particular user. So for that, we we want to say that uh, the each producer for each producer, each each um, only one copy should be given to like a particular customer. So um, with all these things together, um, it it kind of so sol it solves the two-sided fair recommendation problem like this. So whenever you have a data set, you can use your favorite recommendation algorithm to find relevance scores and then use them as valuations. And then you can put these constraints, which are this hierarchical constraints. And you can see this is kind of a laminar constraints actually. And uh, the, the reason we cannot use the swap algorithm here is that the valuations can actually be different for each agent. So we cannot really assume identical valuations here. We provide a different algorithm to ensure two-sided fairness uh, for this recommendation problem at hand. And um, so, so what we show is our algorithm is able to achieve EF1 among all the customers. And uh, uh, so the problem with this thing is uh, you may not achieve MMS for each of the producers, but then we show that this alpha MMS guarantee can be given to at least a large fraction of the producers. And of course this uh, algorithm runs in polynomial time. So um, theoretically, again, we, we show that not everybody would be guaranteed to get uh, MMS exposure, but uh, in practice, I mean, with 
with real world data sets, what we figured out that uh, this, uh, I mean, using our algorithm, we are able to always achieve MMS fairness. So when alpha is equal to one, uh, this H matrix captures the fraction of producers who achieved uh, exact fairness, exact MMS uh, exposure. And we see that it's almost always uh, true. And let's compare it with top K where you just uh, do it in the traditional way that you find the relevance scores and give top K to a particular customer. In that case, only 20% of the producers achieve uh, MMS fairness. And uh, yeah, so, so the overall takeaway here is with less than 10% loss in the customer's utility, our algorithm is able to provide this two-sided fairness even in, in the, in the, with the real world data sets. Though, although the theoretical guarantee says that, okay, not everybody would get their alpha MMS value, but uh, with practical data sets, we found that it does work. So uh, in summary, we see that EF1 allocations can be obtained even under uh, this uh, uh, general constraint settings. Uh, one negative result is that uh, there are fairness notions which are stronger than EF1, like EFL or EFX. We show that even under cardinality constraints and identical additive valuation, the stronger notions does not exist. And uh, the open question here is that um, EF1 uh, under uh, base order matrix or more general constraints with non-identical additive valuation, uh, it exists or not, like for more than two agents. So for exactly two agents, uh, Dror et al. recently has shown that it does exist, but uh, the question is for more than two agents, what happens? And again, for MMS, uh, the question that remains open is, is there like approximate MMS that, uh, that, that exists uh, with base ordered matriarch constraint and uh, non-identical valuations. And yeah, I mean, additive valuations we can assume. So yeah, with this, with this I'll end my talk. So I have some other uh, results on fair allocation and fair classification. So I'll be happy to discuss. Uh, you can just email me at this um, email ID. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Okay.